and we'll just jump in. Well, welcome everybody to January to 2024. And despite uh, UW's uh, humiliating loss last night at the, at the in the football game, you know, is that uh, we definitely can be proud to be the part of the Pac-2 with WSU, right? And at, uh, and our speaker today, of course, is coming from Oregon State University. So indeed, the Pac-2 will be well represented here uh, this morning. That's know? right. <laughs> <laughs> so... Hey, so it, uh, just a couple of things that I, I always like looking online and seeing what, um, you know, and seeing uh, uh, what, what are the what are the big trends, you know, coming on. And there's a whole bunch of these. All, every gardening magazine, you know, does a trend thing. Uh, but I found these ones quite interesting here. So at the, the first one that I found here, look, edimentals, edimentals. It's a new word for a vocabulary. I don't think it would be accepted in Scrabble, <laughs> but it's plants that are both edible and ornamental. There you go. And so that's a thing. Right. You know, and say, so look, you got a Meyer lemon tree going on there. And I think I think some of the uh, I think they mentioned that this uh, the, the flowers uh, are edible in this uh, the planting behind me here. Um, second one is exploring naturalistic planting. Right. And a perennial. So uh, native plants. Right. You know, is it uh, you know, this is for us. This has always been a theme. Right. You know, but I mean, this is a uh, it's exciting to see this put in the in common space. Right. Uh, to be mentioned up. Um, eco-friendly rain gardens so there's a shout out val for your rain garden you know so this is becoming a big thing look at that great picture by the way isn't that a beautiful picture of the uh, pastas and other um, grasses perhaps some sedges down in there in the rock there right off that edge and then learning to love bugs even those that munch and i'm always i'm always reminded uh jude of don tapio's comments saying tolerance right you know be tolerant you know just let these little guys come in because we know that 80 to 90 percent of all these insects are beneficial you know and so it, uh let's just uh let's let them come on in and then adapting to growing with climate change so climate change is entering the common vernacular right recognizing that this is something that you know that we should be thinking about relative to plantings in our own um in our own area <clears throat> and then beyond dining unique outdoor spaces look at this you know you know here's an here's an example of just ripping up your front lawn and let's put in some grapevines <laughs> you know, so it just you know that's so, a splendid idea that's pretty cool you know again reducing lawn you know which we talk about a lot and then it uh and then uh, put putting that into uh to, you know putting that into orchard or vineyard and embracing gravel gardens for low maintenance. I don't know whether this would work out so well here because the weeds are going to find their way into a gravel garden here. But it is pretty exciting to see this. At, uh, um, at, uh, mm. Although it doesn't, does that look like a dead dog or something in the middle of my gravel garden? Or is that just, uh, is just uh, <laughs> the black next thing? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, something's not right there. And then uh, preserving the garden in creative ways. So pressing flowers, right? You know, and it... Uh, um, uh, or even list extending that into actually at uh, preserving foods, right? You know, coming out of that. And then the biodiversity of stumpery, stumpery gardens. And we, of course, have seen this with some of our garden tours, right? You know, what to do about a stump left in our landscape. And, it, um, and we've seen some beautiful, you know, some beautiful um, uh, um, uh, uh, landscape choices of some of our gardens um, that we've had on the tours, and it uh, it's that was pretty cool to see this recognized in it uh, in public uh, in in the public space. And then finally, cultivating garden knowledge at home, and this is just this was just a pitch for there uh, the magazines and the articles that are going on in here, but it does speak to the fact that there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of YouTubing going on, a lot of blogs, a lot of listservs, a lot of ways that people can learn about gardens, including from our own space. And it, uh, you know, and with that, you know, I'll conclude as we jump into this because I want to, um, and it, uh, as we jump into the meeting. Any other comments, by the way, regarding trends, or how about resolutions, garden resolutions from anyone in terms of 2024? Okay. So today. We have it, uh, a full agenda, lots going on, a lot of announcements to kick into uh, 2024, a training year to be it, uh, to be uh, recognized. And it will be, uh, it uh, will be, uh, Anthony will be joining us here in a while to talk about pollinator friendly weed management. And it, um, and so this is indeed gonna be significant um, uh, relative to, uh, to most of our teachings. Quick reminder of calendar, 
Um, Cindy, Karen, happy birthday to you. Lori, Bev, happy birthday to you. And I will remember your birthday, I promise. You know, um, <laughs> Garnet and Cindy also have their birthdays this month. We have study group coming up next Monday, next Monday, the 15th. You saw that uh, written up in the um, uh, e-news. Um, and at, uh, the board meeting is tonight, tonight at 5.30 p.m., 5.30 p.m. Midge, any comment and at, uh, any encouragement for study group for coming up yes. next Monday? Yes. Um, I want to encourage everybody to join in on the 15th because um, per the request of our presenter, it will not be recorded as he uses examples of some past patients and there's some privacy issues. Uh, he will share his uh, PowerPoint deck and and I'll have that out for, for people to look at. But if you want to listen to his presentation and see what he has to say, um, please join us on the 15th from one to three. Very good. And it's about adaptive gardening for as we age, so. And it's just looking around the gallery here, we are all aging. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. <laughs> but let's let's embrace our age and let's embrace our age with some of these uh, some of the techniques and some of the tools that he'll be talking to us all about. Yeah. So Midge is a great, great speaker. We look forward to joining uh, you next Monday. Okay. And that, uh, Laura, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to you. I know you just joined. So happy birthday to you. That's for sure. OK, uh, January to do's coming from Oregon State University. Here we talking and once again about a garden journal. And it, uh, this is indeed pretty significant, as we can appreciate, given climate change, given the, at, um, uh, you know, the extreme weather conditions that we're all experiencing, we be, we be at the coast here or inland, um, having a journal just to capture what's happening in our gardens makes a whole lot of sense. So at, um, um, this is something that OSU talks about every year, and it's something we all probably can do a better job of keeping a journal. In terms of uh, maintenance and cleanup, you know, there's a note here about remembering to water. And it, um, I actually have a number of plants that are under enclosure and I need to remember to water them. Um, you know, and Don Tappy always made this point too, is that there's many times here, even in the Northwest, right? We're gonna go through dry, uh, dry spells and it, um, and it, um, and it uh, nasty things will happen if your plants um, don't get enough water. Okay, um, January to do's, there's talk about, uh, there's, a, there's a new publication um, that is out there regarding propagating deciduous evergreen trees from cuttings. And it uh, may be a little bit, a bit of a technique right here, but I mean, this is really the time that OSU is recommending um, to think about propagation. And it, um, so this is, and some plants, as we know, the willows and so forth, very easy to propagate. Grapes, very easy to propagate. Um, other uh, other plants a little bit more requiring a little bit more technique, but a shout out for this new publication from WSU regarding uh, propagation with um, stem cuttings. Soil testing, you know, do as we say, not as we do. We all need to test our soils probably more than we are doing. Um, but uh, both OSU and WSU have lists about labs where soil test. Uh, could be prepared. Again, my recommendation is the OSU list, I think is far more garden friendly as opposed to ag friendly. Um, but at, uh, at any rate, um, we definitely need to be reckoned, we definitely need to be testing the soils because again, the leaching that we certainly get here at the coast of the nutrients is profound. And that just changes the chemistry of our gardens here at the coast, uh, just so dramatically. January to do's regarding pest monitoring. Again, that um, interesting talking about there were field mice damage, you know, on lower trunks of trees. Use traps and approve baits as necessary. It, uh, it, uh, it uh, OSU is not hesitant about uh, protecting your protecting their orchards. Um, interesting talking about dormant sprays for um, roses, right? And it uh, perhaps even replacing susceptible varieties uh, with resistant cultivars next month. Um, so again, some of these are Oregon, I'm sorry, these are all Oregon and Western Oregon um, uh, uh, recommendations, but um, uh, so, so they may, you know, uh, we're obviously a little bit further north and, it, um, and because of our coastal conditions may have a little bit more, uh, more wet conditions to deal with, okay? 
house plants, you know, and this is a time monitoring for correct water and fertilizer, uh, propagating. And at uh, plant is an idea. I thought this is interesting. Planting dwarf annuals inside to use as house plants, you know, so you're going to provide color and it, um, you know, and just little seedlings. So it's interesting thoughts here just at, um, of actually just um, uh, creating your own house plants uh, from seed on the inside. So some interesting thoughts. Okay. Okay. Judah, I wanted to put you on the spot. You know, we talked oh, at our okay. we talked at our strategic meeting last month about reintroducing the Tapio moment, and as a recall, you know, when Don was our faculty liaison, he would often bring into the uh, meeting a topic just for a few minutes of just to show something, just to uh, just to make a point, mm -hmm. just to share an example. And I asked Jude to pick up on the book that she recommended in this month's e news. Please share. Um, I, I read a lot. And uh, the last couple of years, I've been sort of honing in on climate change. So I've read quite a few books. This was the best one I've read for an ordinary person who maybe doesn't have a huge scientific background, but has curiosity. Basically, this thing says we are fragile creatures. And we didn't appear on the earth until conditions were just right for us. And the just right for us is really a fairly narrow band. And it's talked about the kinds of changes that have happened in the past, like the Ice Age, and how human beings, when they were on the earth, had adjusted to that or survived that mainly. It also talks about how we can look to the future and survive whatever kind of climate change might be happening to us right now it's uh so it gives you a historic perspective about us as a species and what our needs as a species are and that our environment is changing and will be will we be able to survive with it and it's a very very hopeful book and i i think he is regarded as one of the real experts on climate so i recommend you read it if you can, and it is in the in the Timberland li Library system. Quite a few copies, in fact. I was going to comment. So, in your review, I got a very pessimistic view, <laughs> but you're saying this is a very optimistic book. It, the the pessimism is it's going to happen, and there's nothing we can do about it. But so this does have optimism in it when we have survived lots of different things. And how can we prepare ourselves for what is pretty sure to come along, like higher temperatures? And some of the, the planting instructions you had just earlier in this program are saying that we need to maybe change some of the plants we're growing, yeah. get rid of those that are marginal and go to those that can survive tougher times. But no, I'd say it's it's helpful. And it explains so many things about climate science that I hadn't learned before. So I appreciate it. I'd be glad, happy to discuss this book with anybody who wants to read it. I have a little little book discussion. Most excellent. And for all of us thinking about our continuing education hours for 2024, here's a great way to start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Jude, thank you for sharing and thank you for the pitch. Okay, I also wanted to do a pitch here, uh, you know, and Elizabeth wanted to chime in on this, is that uh, the new website, you know, that we've got the new website here, right? You know, so, you know, pnwmg.org will take you to pnwmg.mastergardenerfoundation.org. So you don't have to learn a new URL, pnwmg.org will still work. But we really wanted to push the fact that that, see that little plug, that MGV, that Master Gardener Volunteer plug? There's a way to get in to a whole bunch of information that's just for us, including our calendar and other news and, um, and ideas. And it, uh, it's important. One of the points we wanted to get to and make sure that we're generally announcing and reminding everyone is that when we have news or dates or events that we need to get published to our community, to our Master Gardener community, please reach out to Vivian, to Chris, or to Karen Young for Facebook. Um, Chris, I see you're on. And Elizabeth, do you want to add anything? Comment anything? 
Thank you, Kelly, for bringing this up. And I think the only thing I want to add is that um, we're looking at pulling together a group of folks who can actually create a process and then how to share it is going to be the big thing. But Chris, how about you? I don't have anything to say right now, except if people are having difficulty navigating that volunteer page, um, you can certainly email me. I'm happy to talk to you over the phone, you know, walk you through. And if you can't find something, please let Vivian or me know, and either we'll find it and get you to it, or we'll get it up there if it's missing. There you go. You can't ask for more. That's you know, right. but, uh, okay. uh, help help desk service served right here in Grays Harbor <laughs> County. I tell you. And the the only other question I have, Chris, we still need to have a password to get into the MGV part. That little that little lock over there indicates. Yes, you need and it's the same old password we've used all along. Yeah. And and Kelly and just Kelly posted just it. Yep. Uh, that D is not capitalized. Oh, there you go. I don't know if it would file you up, but for sure it's not. Yeah, that's okay. it. Very good. Rhonda, you have a question, comment. I will just comment that I worked with Chris quite a bit on the website when I was having trouble, and she truly is marvelous and getting you in and accessing it with no worries or no troubles. So yeah, she's a great asset for us. There you go, Chris. Are you blushing? Is that why you're not on camera? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that shout out. Hey, so again, use the website. You know, the website is there for us, right? And, it, uh, and so this is a general reminder. Let's get the news up there and let's encourage all of our members to use and leverage that website and Facebook, right, for, it, uh, for the news that we have to get here. Okay. Okay. I want to. Can uh, I, Kelly, oh, yeah. can yeah. I clarify something? Please. I think Facebook really has stuff geared to the public versus volunteers so for example if um if somebody's doing a plan clinic and they need volunteers then that that belongs in the on the volunteer page of the website not in facebook well stated well stated okay okay if if i may add just quickly um i've been doing some work on this because I know nothing about it. So I was appointed to do this. And I've talked to Vivian and Chris and Elizabeth and Vivian and I, Jude even wrote a, a kind of a template that Vivian liked where we could be begin the process of formalizing and Sharon used the language codifying this process in our bylaws. I don't know if that's a thing, but it would be nice to have a central location where this information is stored. So um, we're gonna be talking about that at the board meeting tonight. If we have time, it's a pretty energetic agenda. We do have a lot, but I really appreciate the pitch for the board meeting tonight because I'll be concluding. I'll be concluding with a reminder for everyone that our board meeting is open to all. It begins at 5:30 p.m. I'll have the URL posted at the end of this presentation, but it's also available in e-news. Okay. Hey, so on to some announcements here. Um, I wanted just to kick. I wanted to kick some things off here just by noting that uh, we did. We did um, uh, in the last month. Uh, we lost two of our <laughs> treasured master gardeners. Uh, Doris, um, you know, Haggett and, it, um, and uh, Sharon Golightly uh, passed away uh, this past month. Um, as you saw in the e-news, there is um, uh, 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 some, uh, there's some notes and some follow-up on both of those individuals for remembrances. And I would encourage everybody to, uh, to follow through on that. Um, they will both be missed most sincerely. Um, and, it, um, and so this is indeed, it's a sad time and recognition that our time together is precious and that our relationships together as master gardeners um, are, are a family of sorts. And so as a community, right, we come together 
and it, uh, we want to celebrate their contributions to um, our program and to each other as a community. Um, any other thoughts or reflections on Doris or Sharon? Yeah, I do. I have one about uh, Go Lightly. She, uh, when I came down here, I found out that she was working with my dental hygienist I had up in Issaquah. And uh, such a small world. She was helping her uh, and uh, her partner uh, find ways to do things in their search for uh, helping people that don't have money to have their teeth worked on. Other thoughts, other comments? I wanted to comment that uh, that I also sent out a card on behalf of our group um, to Sharon's sister yesterday, just FYI, but I'm sure that if anyone else wants to send anything, um, that would be welcomed. <clears throat> um, Sharon and I, this is Karen, Sharon and I, um, I lived right in Oakdale or right outside of Oakdale where she passed away. So we used to talk a little bit about the Central Valley and that part of it. And she was a great state rep and I'm gonna miss her so much. Any other thoughts, any other comments? And again, that, uh, you know, check out e-news for where remembrances will be given. We do expect that Sharon will have a, that there'll be an event up in uh, Pierce College uh, where, you know, her, her dental hygiene colleagues will be are organizing a program. Uh, and more info on that, um, you know, uh, Bev will be our conduit for that. Yeah, I've been I've been checking um, Sharon's Facebook page because that's where a lot of things have been posted about her. And so as of this morning, I still don't know exactly uh, the day and time. Um, but as soon as I find out, I'll I'll let everybody know. This is Terry. Um, Gloria Womer and I went to Doris Hagat's. Um, uh, memorial on Saturday and took flowers and a card on behalf of the Master Gardener group. She and her husband, Ralph, were, um, they, they joined our group in 1994, which was the very first class that um, Don Tapio taught. And they were very involved um, up until, uh, unfortunately, Ralph died. And they both uh, we heard from their family members that both found master gardeners to be just a joyful part of their lives. And uh, that was really nice to hear. Very thoughtful. And again, it speaks to the community that we've all created and the community that we value all together. Okay, I wanted to give out some other um, some other announcements here as we just kick into some other things here. Uh, um, uh, uh, reminder here is that uh, you know we meet together today as a general meeting, a general meeting of a, uh, of of us as a as a foundation, um, and we talk about our program and we make distinguishes between what the program is and what the uh, and what the foundation is. Remember, so as a foundation, uh, we are a nonprofit. Right, just a, a nonprofit recognized by the IRS as a 501c3. Um, we raise money to support the program because we are one of only two counties, right? One of, one of only two county programs in the state that have to support our uh, count, our, 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 all of our um, uh, coordinators. Um, the program, of course, is run by WCU Mass, WC Extension. And it's a very, that uh, this is the program by which our training is credentialed and our services to the public are, are underwritten. So there's a distinction here between the program as master gardeners for who, that we all subscribe to and remain uh, supportive of and uh, remain um, um, uh, credentialed by, and then the foundation as a nonprofit. So to that point, our foundation is led by Elizabeth, our president, and our president-elect Mike is at, uh, in waiting here. The rest of the officers that we elected in our, um, uh, in our very non-contentious and non-polarized election <laughs> from October are listed here. 
Uh, and so it, uh, and they'll be uh, supported by the region directors, Renee, Valerie, and Sushila, supporting Pacific County, Greater Grays Harbor, and Coastal Grays Harbor. And again, this is indeed a reminder then that all of us, you know, are necessary in terms of supporting the programs going in. So as we know, Tony Gwynn has retired as a faculty liaison. And it, um, 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 and so we will have a new faculty liaison that is being uh, worked through uh, by WCU Extension. Um, Alina and Brenda are continuing as our coordinators. These are volunteers. Not only are Alina and Brenda uh, master gardeners, but they're also volunteering as coordinators uh, is our, is to, to support the, the liaison functions with, w, with the WCU Extension program. Heads up that this will be Alina's last year as a coordinator. So Alina will retire her coordinator position at the end of 2024. And so this is an opportunity for any of us to step into that role. Given the size of our two county areas, 3,500 square miles, right? It's half the size of Massachusetts. You know, we definitely need two, if not more, you know, coordinators to manage the overall program liaison activities that go, the administrivia, if you will, that is necessary to manage the program. So at, uh, I'll continue to speak out uh, about this as we get into the year, reaching out for a volunteer from among our community to serve as a replacement for um, uh, Alina as she retires at the end of this year. Um, Elizabeth, do you have any other comments regarding that um, uh, status of, you know, the, the you know, our, uh, the, the liaison search, the liaison replacement? You know, I had a meeting with, with Dan Tudorberg, um in, well, last month. Don't remember what day. And w that was one of the things we discussed. I'm hoping he said that he was still working on trying to figure out what's going on and he's going to join our meeting next month. Mm -hmm. So I am hoping that Dan will have a little bit more clarity. If not, he's, one of the things he's going to focus on is how do we communicate with our respective commissioners in our different counties regarding what the what value the Master Gardener program has and how important it is. Yeah. But Kelly, I really appreciate you bringing up about Elena retiring. Um, having been program coordinator and having stepped in and been able to work with Sharon Coolish Bales for a couple of years before she retired, okay. having that time to train with someone who knows what they're doing um, is really critical. So if folks can think about this, because it's, you know, it's a lot of work, but you know what? There was an awful lot of really kind of cool things that happened. Um, and that I was pre-COVID, so I met a lot of people from around the state and heard a lot of things about what was going on around the state. So it was really kind of fun. So be thinking about that. Make a decision or, or at least work, talk with Elena and Brenda long before the end of the year. We don't want Brenda to be lonely for 2025. We don't want anyone lonely, especially <laughs> our program. Okay. A shout out, by the way, in terms of recording our hours, we're into a new year now, right? So all of us, right, you know, have an obligation to get our hours in both for program support, education, uh, plant clinic support, demo garden support, as well as, of course, uh, to, as well as our continuing education. So it, uh, this is the time to make sure that we're adding impact unto Give Pulse. And as, as we say every month here, if anyone has any problems accessing Give Pulse or, at, uh, or navigating the, uh, the menu structure there, reach out to Alina or Brenda. And it, uh, it's so important to get those hours in. Um, Brenda, Alina, any comment regarding the new year and Give Pulse and getting hours in? Um. Basically, I've pretty much wrapped up the uh, recertifications. Still just missing a couple, but I'm following up on those. And um, so everything seems to be pretty good in Give Pulse. Um, I can give a quick update on training if you'd like to hear that now. Um, we have 41 trainees on our list. And... Um, we are doing meet and greet Zooms this week um, to meet all of them. We have five scheduled. We did two yesterday, so we've already met 17 of them. Um, they Next Monday, the 15th, they will start having access to sign up in Canvas for their online training and pay that fee. And then um, orientation comes up 
on Saturday the 20th, where we will actually meet them in person and they will pay their fee for the foundation. And one last thing is that in addition to the 41 trainees, we also have three people transferring into our county uh, as of January, one from Lewis, one from Yakima, and one from Clallam. So that's all good news. We're a happening place, I tell you. Hey, no, no, seriously, that is that is great news. How can people, um, you know, it's, I've got the calendar for all the training sessions up on the screen now. And of course, as you can see for 2024, we're extending this training through the year, right? So it's just, it really stretches through the year. Is there, um, uh, you know, Brenda, if, if folks want to volunteer or participate in any of these classes and so forth, is there any, how, how, should, how should they begin to engage? So we're going to be um, conducting classes in four geographic locations. So anyone interested in helping with um, any classes starting in February, uh, we've got orientation covered. And with this amount of trainees, we're not going to be able to handle more than them. And the training committee and uh, Helen Hep will be taking pictures. But so that really is not an open event. But starting in February, anybody that would like to volunteer uh, for Ocean Shores, they need to contact Sushila Rivard. For the Montesano location, they need to contact Elizabeth Sims or Rhonda Kennedy. For the South Bend location, they need to contact me. And for the Ilwaco location, they need to contact Elena. And just let us know that you want to help out, whichever ones, uh, we can surely use the help. We do have a few mentors from last year's class, but um, we certainly need more help. So that would be great. It's incredibly exciting thinking about 41 people coming through and they're pretty evenly distributed. Is that right? Across the, uh, all four locations? Well, uh, I think there's 27 for Greater Grace Harbor, approximately 10 for Ocean Shores, uh, approximately 10, maybe a little more for the peninsula and South Bend and Highway 105 up to Grayland and Westport. We've got four there. So mostly even except for uh, North Pacific County, but uh, we'll take what we can get. This is very significant. So this is indeed as exciting. Um, and this is what we've made, uh, you know, this again, as we were talking um uh, earlier, right, you know, is that um, we're taking technology to the fullest advantage, you know, so that each site will have an owl, each site will be connected. And so it'll be an interactive and engaging training across four sites. So, okay. Thank you so much. Um, you. I wanted this again, I wanted to shout out here for volunteer opportunities, right? So this is a, it's a training year mm. and everyone's support is so, is so needed. Uh, for this, you know, for this. So please uh, consider supporting um, uh, these four sites during the training activities we're coming up. Other dates to be thinking about, by the way, for 2024 and to get on your calendars even now are the Home and Garden Show. So the weekend after Mother's Day, that's May 18th and 19th, that's the Saturday and Sunday, although setup's going to be the Thursday, Friday ahead of that. It's a huge show and a huge show program. Rhonda, you have any comments in terms of what we're expecting for this year? Good morning. Um, no, not really. I, I, I think we're continuing as we did last year on the home side. We are more or less pushing out the craft vendors and we are expecting another good turnout of um, home improvement, home repair type of contractors. Uh, Robin and I both sent out a save the date email to all the vendors in December and got tremendous amount of feedback and <clears throat> commitments already. So we're increasing what we're taking in and hopefully reducing what we need to rent. Our goal is to increase the amount of income. And yeah, we'll be looking for everybody to come along and help with this coming up in that May. You'll be hearing a lot from Terry. And the sooner you can let her know that you can be there or you can volunteer, the less amount of time she has to spend calling, phoning, and emailing folks. So if you can keep that in mind, it's really helpful. Robin, do you want to add anything? 
Not really. We're just at the beginning stages, but I think it's going to be big. I mean, on the garden side, we were full last year. We literally had every space filled. Um, this year, I've already got new people saying, or the people that were there last year saying, I'd like two booths instead of one. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to give them more room. I think we're going to use the along the back wall, put in more more booths back there. But we'll squeeze them in somewhere. And it, I will also add, it's really helpful as, as community members, as shoppers, as folks who hire for home improvement jobs. If you think or know of some business or you have been to an event where you've seen someone that you think might be a good addition, let Robin and I know. We, um, some of them we don't pursue, but others are exactly what we're looking for. And we do participate in communicating with them. So let us know. It's helpful. Because as Robin Terry and, Ro and Robin point out, this is a big deal, not just for us, but I mean, you know, we have thousands of people that come <laughs> to this event over the course of the weekend. And it, uh, we expect that the overall financial impact to Gray's Harbor is uh, is at least a half million, if not closer to three quarters of a million dollars in terms of revenue impact. So it's a big deal uh, for the a community. lot of people that come and into contact with us. It's so crazy cool. And then, of course, our plant tour and at, uh, the garden tour, rather, and the plant sale uh, it will be in July. It'll be in Pacific County this year. So it's a little bit of a drive for use of, for those of you up north. Um, but it, uh, we're very much looking forward to it. Um, Sharon, do you have any comments regarding it, um, uh, gardens and it, um, and updates that you're looking for now? We, I'm not quite sure how many gardens we actually have. Uh, Terry and I looked at a bunch and we've got some leads for some additional gardens because we're still looking for gardens. If anybody happens to know anyone in North Pacific County who has a beautiful garden, let me know or let Terry know. Very good. Okay, so I uh, wanted to get into this at, uh, as we get into this. Other any other announcements? Any other at, uh, any other feedback? Any other announcements for the good of the order here? Yeah, can I can I chime in here for a quick moment? There's so many people here today. I want to make a note of this. Um, I want to talk about just briefly our um, column in the Senior Sunset Times. Um, we have a monthly column, and I'm struggling to get any buddy to submit an article for me to use for next month's uh, publication. Um, this is an ongoing project. Every month we have a column. Um, the articles need to be submitted by the 15th of the previous month. So we're looking for an article for February and I have to have it by Friday. This is really late notice. I'm pleading, I'm begging. Um, I know there are some authors out there and I know that there are a lot of people that have been, been involved with a lot of great projects that Master Gardeners have been working on. And if you could find the time within the next couple days to put just together a short article 600 to 800 words is the real sweet spot. We can take up to a thousand words, but 600 to 800 allows for pictures. Um, this is something that's just going to be ongoing. And I really could use some people to provide some content for me to submit to the Senior Sunset Times. Um, you earn program support hours if you do this. And um, there's a lot of positive feedback. Um, from the publication. I'm Laura Malikoff is the editor, publisher of the publication. She says she gets a lot of positive feedback on Master Gardener's column. So please, if anybody has anything that they could put together really quickly in the next couple of days and send it off to me, I would really super appreciate it. Thank you. Was that for any topic, Laurie? Any topic, yes. And there's so much we can be talking about, including the trends for 2024 that we just talked about, including at, uh, the climate change in the book that uh, Jude just got into, you know, reading at uh, res New Year's resolutions for your garden, you know. The aging in the garden, I think, would be an, a fabulous topic for that publication. And we could do it over two, two um, months. Uh, that's what we did with Sushila submitted an article um, that had to be divided into two months because it was so long, but it was great article on um, lawn alternatives. So that's an option too. 
Okay, so reach out to Lori and it um, dust up your Shakespearean, um, your, your, sex, your, sex, um, your, your Shakespearean uh, um, <laughs> uh, 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 um, uh, authorship here. Okay, any other announcements? Any other thoughts? Okay. Well, with that, with that, I want to finally introduce Anthony, who is here with us today, joining us here from Corvallis, and at uh, and Oregon State University. So this is this completes the Pac-2 representation of the athletic conference here between WSU and OSU here, and it. Um, and it, uh, you know, I'll let Anthony, it, uh, you know, introduce himself and introduce the programs. But as I, as I noted in our E News introduction, you know, his research is is ex is in a very very broad uh, category of activities here, regarding pollinators, regarding insects, regarding weed control, and weed control that is friendly to our pollinator friends. Um, I put his uh, his contact information here below because there's a lot of other programs. Uh, in some of the community science programs that he'll be speaking about that are going to be pretty significant here. So I want to, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop share and it, um, you know, and invite Anthony to, uh, to come forward here and, uh, um, and share. Thank you, Callie. And thank you, everybody. Um, it's such an honor to be speaking with you and just uh, hearing about um, just all that this group is up to. It's so inspiring. Um, and uh, this presentation was, uh, I think Kelly somehow found, I was presenting to the Washington Weed Conference, which I was very honored to do. It involved waking up at one in the morning and driving all the way up to Wenatchee and back. <laughs> <laughs> but really great, just a lot of weed managers uh, who are working around the state. And so it isn't designed for gardeners. Nevertheless, I do think there are some uh, aspects that you'll find interesting. And as an advanced group, working plant clinics, talking to the public, I think just having a broad thought about weed management might be helpful. I'm going to uh, power up my um, um, PowerPoint here. There we go. There we are. Okay. Whoa, that is way down. That's, that's not where I want to be. Sorry about that, folks. Let's move all the way up here. Okay. There, that's where I want to be. Okay, there we go. Okay. So um, this was a companion talk. I trained thousands of pesticide applicators across Oregon. I think I've trained almost 9,000 on how to read a pesticide label uh, to protect uh, bees when they're doing pest management. And the Oregon Department of Agriculture graciously allowed me to um, offer continuing education credits for you know, weed managers, because a lot of people who take, who are licensed pesticide applicators uh, often don't use insecticides at all or fungicides. They're primarily concerned with managing weeds. So this was my attempt to engage that group and get them to think about how they could uh, manage landscapes to really promote bee health across uh, across Oregon. I This was me going up to Wenatchee. That was November 1st. It was the day of the launch of the Oregon uh, bee license plate. And I do understand that there is a, a, an initiative of Washington to do the same. And uh, the master gardeners in Oregon have been very supportive of this plate, and I imagine you will be as well when it finally comes to Washington. Here's what I want to get, uh, I want to accomplish today. The first one is, I'm sure I'm. This is like bringing coals to Newcastle, <laughs> but I would like um, to just pause for a moment and think about where bees are in the land that we manage. Of course, gardens they're everywhere, but just thinking more broadly about where bees live what they need in the places that they live. I'm then gonna talk about what I consider uh, both on the west and east side of the Cascades, super bee plants that you will find in disturbed areas that uh, really punch above their weight in terms of their importance to bees. And then I want to uh, round things out by thinking about weed management strategies that help bees. I think uh, this is helpful for, I was listening 
early on. I, some, some of you manage acreages, not just, um, gar, uh, you know, manage garden beds. You have area outside of the, um, and, and some of the people that come to the plant clinic will be in the same boat. I think some of these strategies will help you be able to talk with those folks. I'm going to have prompts throughout the talk. There's like seven of them for questions. Let's, uh, this will allow me to complete my thought uh, and then we'll just, it, it's a good pausing point. So they're coming. Here you can see a small sweat bee. She's in a Nooka rose and she's telling you what she needs. She's telling you she needs a place to nest. Um, with some exceptions, all bees make a nest. The females make a nest. And after they commit to that nest, they have to access forage, which in the case of this bee is all found in this rose, the nectar and pollen that this uh, rose is providing. And it has to be provided to them over the course of their individual lives. And many bees um, are solitary. They don't form colonies, they're individuals. They make a nest as you'll see shortly. Or in the case of bumblebees, some sweat bees and honeybees over the lifespan of their entire colony, which for a bumblebee colony, for example, uh, where you are, may start the colony, the bumblebees emerge and start uh, start their nest sometime in you know as early as February to April, and then they're going to complete their life cycle uh, by August. I want to point out this is in contrast to butterflies. Butterflies have no nests. They are constantly moving across the landscape looking for host plants. They also have no real need for pollen. They are, when they're visiting a flower, they're visiting it exclusively to take nectar out of the plant. And what is really important to them are the host plants like this uh, uh, pine white which you can see uh, very happy to be on a thistle nectaring, but really is looking through the landscape for those pine needles of the specific species that it can lay its eggs on. And it'll move through the landscape looking for the female will, looking for these uh, this specific host plant. Very different from bees. I know you're in Washington and I'm in Oregon, but I will tell you how wonderful, uh, Oregon has this wonderful initiative called the Oregon Flora. Volume two is out. It's a beautiful uh, publication, it's thick. And the appendix has this wonderful listing of butterfly food plants. So you can see there is the pine white right at the top, right at the third one, third row down. And it tells you, um, the plant genera that is, is host plant. So if you're interested, check that book out. Let me start a little bit distant from the question of managing, uh, you know, of planting, uh, it's the nesting, the nesting of bees. And point out that, of course, we are all used to this nest. These are honeybee colonies in a, a field, a crimson clover seed field in Western Oregon. Uh, honeybees are used widely through Oregon and Washington uh, to pollinate a wide array of crops, both on the west side um, and the east side uh, of the Cascades. If you just think about Oregon, and this is a very similar picture to Washington, we have um, you know these uh, very productive valleys uh, on the west side uh, where a whole range of seed crops are grown, but also our berry crops, cucurbits, um, uh, also a lot of seeds that are that you will use in your gardens. So those so specialty seeds, the flower seeds, you know, the black-eyed susans, and the you know, you know, acres and acres of cosmos. Those are grown in these areas, and a lot of them are honeybee pollinated. Uh, but we also have, as you go to the east side, our tree fruits um, and um, uh, go to the Tri-Cities area, uh, of course, our, our wonderful watermelons that we have. But I want to point out that honeybees are really the tip of the iceberg. You know this, of course, that there's a variety of bees. They vary in size from these very large bumblebee queens that you're going to be seeing only in a few months from now all the way down to the bottom right-hand corner. You can see that small bee uh, genus Perdita, some of the smallest bees we have in the Pacific Northwest. They look different. 
Some of them are emerald green. Some of them are blood red. You can see that one um, towards the bottom there that's blood red looks more like a wasp. It's a bee. Their behaviors are different. Some of these bees don't make nests. That blood red uh, bee, in fact, is a cuckoo. It, uh, as a, it parasitizes other bees. So they have very different behaviors. Their effectiveness as pollinators varies. Some of them are tremendous pollinators. Some of them are not very good pollinators at all. They steal the pollen and don't really transfer much onto the stigma. But most importantly for what we're talking about today is they have different floral choices. They, there is not one bee plant to rule them all. I'll point out in Oregon now, we know we have about 720 species of bees. So they're very speciose as well. There's a lot of different species out there. This is the same in Washington. If you were to break down all this diversity into something more manageable, something you could tell somebody at a plant clinic, you can say to them, well, there's a lot of bees. They got a lot of different behaviors, but I'll tell you, 70% of them are gonna nest in the ground. And you can see the ones that nest in the ground, they're in color now, they're not grayed out. The typical life cycle is something like this. A female is gonna find the right patch of dirt and they're very specific to the kind of soil that they're looking for. And you'll see a tunnel uh, uh, form overnight. She will, in the evenings, mine that tunnel and during the day she'll fly out she'll collect pollen and she'll put it into one of the little chambers as you can see here she'll lay an egg on that chamber the she'll live a lot of these this is a, a solitary bee so she doesn't have a, any nest mate she's doing this all on her own when she uh, dies that little turret will weather down and underneath the ground outside where you are right now there are thousands of bees under the ground, have eaten that ball of pollen and are just waiting for enough degree days to pop out in the spring. Here's a berm in uh, Bandon. You can see this berm is full of these little holes with bees coming in and out. In, um, Bandon, Oregon, where we have our cranberry industry very much like um, Long Beach down in Washington. Um, I can, I'm not sure I can get this to play. Anyways, this is uh, outside the Hoyt Arboretum in uh, near the Oregon Zoo. This whole hillside at, uh, around Earth Day will erupt uh, with a mining bee. Um, thousands of bees side by side. You can see the person walking by doesn't even notice them there. And this is remarkable. This is in Washington. This is just across. This is just by Walla Walla. The these are. This is a native bee. They're solitary each. There's a lot of them nesting side by side by side. The growers in Walla Walla have learned how to create these beautiful crusty alkaline beds by putting hundreds of pounds of rock salt in the middle of their fields and running these irrigation pipes under. And these bees flock and they pollinate that alfalfa uh, uh, field in the back. Really remarkable. This is the only place on the planet where uh, people have learned how to manage the habitat to encourage this high density of these bees nesting side by side. The bees nest, uh, any, uh, the, we have a graph here that shows the minimum and maximum depth of different bee species reported in the literature. And you can see uh, there's 445 species, I believe in the Western US, most of these are nesting within five inches, but you can see some of them are going three feet down into the ground. Those nests can be extremely long and extremely deep. I'm gonna be quickly rounding this out. Don't worry, we're, uh, questions will come in a second here, but I will point out the other 30% of the bees are cavity nesting. They're the bees that you see in color here now. And typical of these bees, I'm sure, just put in the chat if you're managing mason bees, Mason bees um, are uh, widely used. Here we see the female, she's mining out some mud. She's gonna bring it back to the nest, which could be a hollow twig like this. She'll line the twig with mud, uh, pack it with pollen, lay an egg, close the chamber, do another bee. You can uh, do, do another cell, maybe 12 cells in total. Um, you can purchase these cocoons uh, and the bees will emerge in the spring. And, um, uh, of course, you don't need a twig. You can make these chambers, many of you know, 5 sixteenth. It can be a square uh, a square hole six inches deep, and these bees will nest in them. 
And we do have uh, here at OSU some cards, which I believe Washington State Department of Agriculture may have as well. These are available to you to use in the plant clinic, uh, as many people are interested in mason bees. But I don't want to talk about mason bee culture today, but I, that was a brief, breathtaking view of bee biodiversity. And I just wanted to see at this point if there are any questions. And so, Anthony, just remarking in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the, the variety of species, you think you say there's 700 plus species of bees in, in Oregon, it, about similar than in Washington, you think? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, we're, the, Washington is just in the process of uh, doing what we've done in Oregon and in, in cataloging its bee diversity. And um, yeah, as you move north, there are species we don't have. We have a lot more species that are southern. So I'm, I'm, it's going to be in that ballpark. I'm just stunned though by the number. I guess the over. I just, it just, I, I, I bet that's just that's that's got to be I, you know, just jaw dropping to 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 most people. It is. I think it is. I think it's great. It's just like there's all of. Uh, I think you were talking about journaling er, earlier, and I think, you know, um, there's so much uh, life and diversity and curious things going on in your garden. Um, you, that's the one nice thing about gardening. You can endlessly explore it. There's no into it. <laughs> and I'd not heard about this, uh, this field in uh, Walla Walla. I mean, this is so they actually salt the ground, right? So nothing can grow on it, I guess, except these alkali bees. It's the only county in the US where there's an enforced speed limit for bees. So if you go down to Walla Walla in the you know, third week of June, you'll see these beds and there's actual signage um, enforced by the county that you they don't want you to schmuck the bees as you're driving by. <laughs> <laughs> Questions for Anthony before he continues. All right, the pregnant pause is coming to an end. Okay, here I go. The meat of what I wanted to talk to you about today is the second part, not where they nest, but what they eat, because this is what you have in large part control over as gardeners and as well as people who are managing weeds. Of course, you know about pollination, insect uh, attracted to the nectar. Here we have a brassica flower. I pulled back one of the petals, goes to suck up the nectar with some kind of a tongue. Uh, in the process, as the insect backs out, it hits the anthers, which uh, have the pollen, dislodges some of the pollen that lands on the uh, stigma, uh, and then that pollen grain germinates, it tunnels down through the style, uh, pollinates, uh, you know, fertilizes the ovaries, and then you have a long pod of seeds come out of this. Honeybee, I mean, bees and all, bees, uh, are unique in that they eat the pollen. And they, you know a bee, if you see an insect flying through the air that's carrying pollen on its body, it's a bee. So bees are really good pollinators because they're trying to rummage off as much of that pollen as they can and bring it back to the nest. If we follow this honeybee who has a special spoon-like structure on the back of her leg that she uses to pack pollen on back to her nest, you'll see it here. So each one of these little honeycombs that you remember from the cereal as a kid, honeycomb, the honeycomb there, you see that yellow pollen stuffed in the cell. And in the middle, you see those brown dome cappings. That's the developing uh, nursery for the bees, the, the brood. You can see I've uncapped one of the cells there. You can see the little white head, the rub head underneath. That was powered off that pollen. That's how the bees grow, they reproduce. When the pollen starts coming in, the colony can expand. Pollen, I want to point out, many people think flowers have nectar and pollen, not all do. Poppies are great examples of pollen-only plants. Um, and of course, as you all know, you don't have to have a native poppy to attract bees. Any of the, uh, any of the pollen-rich uh, exotics will also be just jammed full of bees trying to get that easy pollen out of them. I will also point out that lupins are pollen only plants and I will in the spirit of the pack to point out that the pollen on the back legs of this bee is beaver orange. Uh, we all did not fare so well in these uh, football season but nevertheless we do have uh, pollen that's associated with the beautiful flower. I did want to uh, quickly just make a, a brief remark 
because I know many of you are interested in creating meadows like the one you see behind you. This is in uh, Silvernail with the Plant Materials Center in Corvallis with the Natural Resource Conservation Service. You can see a lot of poppies in this mix and they've put out a great publication. Um, you can see here, there's a QR code that you, if you turn your camera on and scan it, it'll bring it up. But the warning that they have in here is whenever you do a seed mix, be very careful of uh, river lupin or, and that it's not included here, but California poppy, you should never go above 10% of a seed mix with these two species, they will take over. They will dominate, they're very aggressive. So two things to mention on these two wonderful bee plants. But to get at this question of like flowers and the bees connection to them, let me bring you to this you know common uh, landscape feature. We've got black-eyed Susan and Russian sage beautiful, great uh, kind of ornamental feature to have late in the summer when everything is dry, two uh, water-wise plants that put on a great show. Now, if you go, look at this, folks. These plants are side by side, right beside each other. If you go in and look carefully, you'll notice the bees are completely different. On the black-eyed Susan from the top, you have this bee with the very fuzzy back pollen collecting leg. This is the, these are bees known as the sunflower bees. You have a sweat bee in the middle and at the very bottom that little flying ant is the small carpenter bee. All of these, uh, two of these bees, the sweat bee and the small carpenter bee are there because if you look at a, a composite like a black eyed Susan, the, the depth to get to the nectar is very shallow and these bees are short tongue bees, they don't have very long tongues. Uh, the sunflower bee is there for another reason that I'll get to in a second. But in contrast with the Russian sage, that's where you'll see your honey bees and your bumblebees. And in the middle, you have a leaf cutting bee. These are known as long tongue bees and they have a tongue length deep enough to get into the corolla and get the nectar. These other bees would never be able to get their tongue down deep enough. To make this point maybe more, more uh, Bluntly, let's look at this uh, flowering golden currant. Here you can see this bumblebee queen, and there's bees all over this field, but she's the only one on this flower. Can you guess why? Look how deep the corolla is. To get to the nectar, you have to have an extremely long tongue, and she's the only one with a, a very long enough tongue to get down there. We have so all this, sorts of plants. So, so oh, yeah, to this go point, ahead. Anthony, are you recommending then a variety of plants, you know, you know, to accommodate a variety of bee species? Because this, I guess, yeah. you, a, a monoculture, I guess, would be very exclusive to just one or two, you know, uh, uh, species. Yeah, if, I guess the, the rule here, I'm going I'm to try and get you a little bit closer to it. The kind of like uh, the if the agnostic way of doing this, you have no information, is plant a variety of, beef, uh, of plant families. If you have a lot of families or gen, plant genera, you'll likely by chance fluke across these kinds of uh, uh, flower differences. But one way you can think about this as well is there is this one aspect of, of flower shape. So flowers, I have examples of some, um, well, the hairy vetch is not native, but the other two are. You can see they've got very long approaches, very tight, narrow flowers. And to get into them, you need a long tongue. And so you'll often find on those flowers, bees with exceedingly long tongues, like those bumblebees. Or here's a bee that you'll see in the spring. You can see how long her tongue is. These are the spring, um, uh, spring longhorn bees, uh, very long tongues. You'll find them just mining. If you have you know, Amsinchia or, you know, the Larkspur, they'll just, they'll just have a trap line to those flowers because they're the only ones that can access the nectar. Flower shape is important, but I want to point out that the more important thing where you really see the diversity is pollen specialization. So this is not a, a matter of like bee fitting flower shape. It's a matter of the bees being able to digest the pollen. Typically bees that have are social, that have to span multiple seasons, honeybee, bumblebee, you know, bumblebee colony starts in the spring and has to go all the way to the late summer. Flowers are gonna come into bloom and out of bloom. 
they've developed the capacity to digest the pollen from a wide range of plants, multiple families. But that's really, um, that's not the case for all of the bees. Some bees are oleolectic. Polylectic is a wide range, is the term for digesting a wide range, having a very broad diet. Oligolectic, many bees can only collect and digest pollen from one family of plants. And some, monolectic, are very specialized, and you will only find them visiting a single genus of plant. If you don't have that plant, the bee won't be there, just as you were saying. So I want to point this out because a lot of plants that you will grow, like I know native plant gardening is something dear to your hearts, something like deer brush or California lilacs, both the native ones and the ones, the selections from California will always be jammed full of bees. If any of you have, I don't know if it gets too cold up there, but I, the native ones are a lot more hardy. Um, if you have a California lilac, they just, as soon as they come into flower, they're full of bees. But I'll point out that a lot of the bees there are not very weird. They're kind of just regular bees. And so if you want to find the strange bees, the ones, the mythical ones, you have to be a little bit more agile. An oligolectic bee, for example, on all of the composites, if you grow sunflowers or echinacea or any, you'll see this bee, um, bees in the genus Melisodes, they are only go to composites. So you'll only find them on asters of some sort. So on the east side, um, you'll see them on rabbit brush. They're notable because they're, the females, their back legs are so fuzzy uh, that they just look like they're wearing chaps. And the males have these very long antenna. You'll see, I'm sure you've seen them on a sunflower. They just go round and round and circle on the sunflower. This whole genus will only uh, be, will only be found on composites. When you get to the east part of the state, but even on the west side, diadasia is almost exclusively found either on cactuses or on mallows. So if you have checker mallow, you'll run into diadasia. And then this one here um, is monolectic. You only find it on calicortis species. And in fact, this one here is so tightly connected with subalpine calicortis lilies that you know you see the lilies, you see the, the bees. They are just totally tightly connected. Um, which is going to bring me to the next part of my talk. And Kelly talked about this earlier, an initiative we have in the state to find the bees of the state. Here you can see some of our volunteers waiting for the calicortis lily to um, erupt on a very dormant Mount Hood, uh, uh, this um, at high elevation. These folks are who I went to when trying to think about how to tell land managers what plants they need to look out for when they're managing uh, rights of way. The quick diversion I'm gonna make here is what we have in Oregon and that you have now in Washington is we connected curious people with uh, the plants, the really interesting plants and wild bees. And this is the Oregon Bee Atlas. And so this brings me to my second objective is the super bee plants that are found on rights of way or other, other disturbed areas. Um, so to find the, uh, let me first, um, tell you what a super bee plant is, I made this definition up for I told um, the people who do rights of way management, a super bee plant is not a noxious weed. It already grows in disturbed areas. So you already have it. It's already growing on roadsides. It supports some of the rare bees in the state, but also helps our manage honeybees, particularly in the late summer when there's nothing but Queen Anne's lace in the ditch. So this is the program that uh, comes out of curious people, um, uh, uh, plants and wild bees. We modeled it on the master gardeners. It's called the master melatologists. These are the people, a melatologist is some, somebody who studies bees. And it was really based on the master gardeners. I will say the inspiration for the program was the Josephine County uh, master Gardener Entomology Group. I, I went down there in 2017 uh, and I saw that master gardeners were already collecting insects. They already, they had divided their um, entomology group up into different orders. They were collecting from different orders. They had bought a cabinet. They were making uh, collections at the teaching collections for um, 
for the plant clinic and for the community. And I thought, well, if, uh, there's clearly a lot of more capacity than I thought. There are people out there who can do really careful work. This doesn't need to be sequestered in the university. And so away they go. These folks go across the state. You often find them at picnic grounds. Um, they collect bees. They um, drink beer. Um, they hang out. It's a lot of fun. It's modeled off of this, and this comes back to the whole thing of journaling. Charles Robertson um, uh, was um, the son of a chemist. I think he had uh, uh, he didn't have to earn an income, so he spent um, a, a number of decades in southern Illinois uh, collecting bees, and you can see his ledger where he would note the bee and the flower it was on. So he had this, um, it hasn't been really replicated since, this really detailed study of the bees of plants of Southern Illinois. We were inspired by this. So our volunteers, as whenever they collect a bee, they associate it with the plant. So you can see here in Oregon, this is a little bit old, but they've collected off of, you know, 20,000 locations of the state and almost 1500 species of plants. That allows us to create something like this, a bee plant network. Pretend you have on the bottom a bunch of bee species denoted by their color. So red, yellow, blue. And the red bee, for example, goes to different species of plants. It goes to the pink species, the blue, and the green, but it doesn't go to the yellow. In contrast, that dark blue species of bee only goes to the yellow species of plant. Just in your mind, what kind of bee, what kind of diet breadth does this bee have? Right. If you said, if your mind said oligolactic, um, I'm sending over brownies right now by FedEx. It will be at your door shortly. This is uh, what we've produced. So you can see the bees on the top, the plants on the bottom, and each one of those connections connects them together. And this is the largest bee plant network in the world that these volunteers have put together. It's really remarkable. We know. Uh, we're knowing in increasing detail, uh, if we know what the plant is, we can tell what the bee is. I do want to uh, get you pumped. If you are interested, if I have um, got your interest, there is a Washington Bee Atlas that has started up. Um, they're looking for volunteers. So if you're entomology minded and would like to do some uh, wild bee hunting, uh, just go to the WASDA website and um, they'll tell you how to get involved. Anyways, I sent a Facebook post out to our volunteers and I said, listen, I got to talk to Department of Transport crews. What are the plants that you, the big bee plants that you see in rights of way? I told them that it can't be invasive and we've got some great, I'll tell you, things like um, knapweed and uh, thistles have remarkable native bee biodiversity. But I said, you can't, we can't, I can't tell them. They'll run me out of the room if I recommend them. I will point out when it comes to garden design, so I'm going to take you to some plants, but when it comes to garden design, we do have some cards, which I know WASDA now makes available in the state of um, Washington, the West of the Cascade card. So if you're interested, you can contact them and they will get you cards for your, um, for your uh, plant clinic. But I want to focus on the plants on the West side that rights of way crews regularly encounter that are important. First and foremost are willows. Willows are, there's a number of specialist bees that go specifically to those male willow plants. And I know willows are hard if you don't have property, they're hard to grow. I, I have just uh, uh, went, we have some great native plant nurseries here and I've got some of those prostate willow ground covers. I'm, I'm hoping they'll allow me to grow willows in a small space. But willows are a really high value spring plant for many of our native bee species. I also point out that uh, our big leaf maple, especially if you're rearing mason bees, is critical. If you want to get good mason bee returns, have a maple close by. If you just look at the flowers on this, you know, they're just jammed full of flowers when they come into bloom. Perhaps not great in a garden. Um, although, you know, they've got better varieties now, it sometimes can look a little bit sad in a garden, but Oregon grape 
is a really keystone plant in Western Oregon when it comes to our wild bee, uh, uh, our wild bees in the spring. Camas is something that you looks pretty in a garden, and of course, uh, who can you can never get enough bulbs. So, uh, camas is a great source of uh, pollen for a lot of our bees. I will also point out that some of these plants can be a pain in the ass in a garden setting, but on uh, rights of way, if they're managed and cut back, they can be, uh, you know, super. Uh, our roses or nuka roses really uh, are a hinge point between the spring, the early spring. In the early summer, they really provide uh, pollen and nectar at a time when there's not a lot around, a little bit of a lull. I always love watching bumblebees on roses. Uh, you probably know that bumblebees buds pollinate uh, on flowers like tomatoes, which the nectar is held on the inside, but they will buzz on roses because they just are trying to get up, trying to be as rapid as possible and get a lot of pollen off them. Uh, that roadside ditch full of vetch that helped, fell off a hay truck, I always tell road crews to leave that. There's a whole lot of bumblebees, uh, fast flying and thophora digging bees that will just eat up all the nectar and pollen that comes out of a vetch patch. Then we get into the late summer, the grindelias. Uh, we've got many species, uh, both in Washington and Oregon, and uh, really high value uh, and one may I might add in here are our tar weeds. I don't didn't include tar weeds. We have a lot of specialist bees on tar weeds, and I know they're terrible in a garden setting because they, you know, they really open just they're closed in midday. You know, it's our native uh, west side sunflower, but you know, uh, they really have a lot of great bees on them. But back to gumweed, um, they they collect the resin, uh, they love the pollen and nectar. It comes at a time of year when everything is dry and crispy. And as you can see here from Oregon flora, both their number of species east and west side. Goldenrods. And of course, goldenrods can get big and rangy. Um, there are all sorts of, you know, there's all sorts of cultivars available, but really goldenrods are superb uh, late season sources. And as a composite, you will see those sunflower bees specializing on them. Here you can see a stand with some pearly everlasting. And you may not know this, but uh, you know uh, we have a number of golden rods. The you know the variety that you typically get is from the east, but we've got species here in the west. I want to round things out. Many of you probably already have either Halls or Douglas Asters. They are superb, and as you know, they will bloom right up until um, until frost. Um, they're prolific. They will take over. You clearly need to put them in a place that's, uh, you know, cordoned off because they will march through your garden. But nevertheless, hardy, uh, water-wise, many bee species on it. I'm going to not talk about the east side, but I do typically at these weed talks, I know they usually have crews from east and west. I will point out one thing. When you get to the east side, the plants are uglier. So if you look at this, man, it's a good plant, but man, is it ugly. And, or here, even worse, is uh, wire lettuce. Ugly as sin, but man, it's going to spray bees. Okay. All right. Um, let me take a pause there and see if there are any questions uh, before I uh, wrap things up with weed management. I would think that many of the species you're mentioning here from Oregon actually grow here. I mean, that they certainly are not uncommon to us, Anthony, right? Oh, they're all the same. There, there may yeah. be, may have some more species. There may be a couple species, but all of those plants uh, in the generic are in Washington, and they're going to be good in Washington. Now, can we actually find seed stock for some of these? Because these, 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 I, I appreciate the fact that, you know, as, as you're introducing this to road crews, you're, you know, they're generally considered weeds, you know, and yeah. undesirables, you know. But yet, you know, as you've, as you've pointed out, they're a tremendous food source, right, for these bees. Yeah, I think all of the, I'm just look, I'm just recounting all of them. You can find every one of them in a nursery. They're not, they're not obscure. Of course, in a garden setting, you can go, you can be even more, you, you have, a, you can grow a lot more because there's a lot more availability. And maybe the way you might think about this talk is you're talking to a land, somebody comes and they say, I've got this area, I want to create bee habitat. It will be, I think, 
telling them before you turn up the soil and release the demons that are in your seed bank, take a look at what you have. Here's, I'm going to give you a list of plants. Look for these plants and start to work around them. Because as soon, the first thing you're going to get, folks, is people say, I want a meadow. And you know what's going to happen. It's going to turn into a blackberry patch. You want to dissuade them from doing this. You want them to sort of stop, pause, take an inventory of what they have, and start to work around it. I think that's what I would really emphasize with this. Of course, you know, this, when you get into highly landscaped areas, you just have a lot more control. This really is significant, Anthony, because one of the things that you know all of us can uh, can can report here is that we're getting so many people moving out to the coast and to our our rural environments here because they're they're fleeing the cities, right? And it um, and they're coming from all parts of the country, and it um, and so they are indeed asking, just as you're saying, how do I develop a beautiful landscape? So they're you know they're um, and they're eager to start um, digging up their um, their lawns their 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 grounds yeah and of course if it's a small area you tell them the sheep mulch you say mulch 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 and you know but they, but it's when they've got this i've got two acres of it and then it's kind of like this is where i think this next section will be helpful so i see kath asked about pesticides and i'm going to i'm going to talk about um residual herbicides. So I think one of the issues, people do use herbicides to manage lands. It's, you know, in some ways, if you're going to be starting fresh, or if you're trying to even pr protect something, having some uh, amount of herbicide is, can be very useful. It can get you, uh, get you a lot farther. I know many hardcore uh, restoration ecologists rely on using some level of herbicides to deal with some of the more problematic weeds. And I, I'm going to talk in a little bit about some of those herbicides reside in the soil for a long time. And so you can, I've run into this with growers who want to do pollinator habitat. Usually the herbicide is the residual can be a year or two years with some of these. So they plant and they get no, no germination is because there's just too much herbicide residing still. Uh, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so let's talk about weed management. So this is the, the what I try to tell the road crews is that you already have where you're working high value plants. Your ethos should be protect what you have, and then if there's if there's a, a, a windfall of cash in the state, then you could go in and plug some plants in. But if you're like it is in Oregon right now, where they're cutting back crews, and you don't have a lot of time, protecting the big valuable assets is what you should focus on. For road management, for those of you who, um, we just had that rainstorm last week, uh, yesterday, you probably know that some of that, when a road, people are managing roadways, have, have concerns of getting that water off the road. Also, they need to make sure that when a car comes off the road, it doesn't hit something that's gonna dent it. So they typically have, um, one area, zone one, right by the road, that there's no tolerance for weeds. If a, if a weed management crew is coming by and spraying herbicides, it's typically on that one area between the road edge. It's only a few feet wide that they have no tolerance. It's got to take water off the road and put it into the soil. But they do have a lot of tolerance as soon as you get out of that zone. So when you move out from that zone, they have an area where you can have plants that you can drive, as long as you can drive over it, it's okay. And then they have an area typically farther out where they can have trees. This is what it looks like here. You can see zone one, pure gravel. It's meant to absorb moisture, but that zone two can have a lot of bee plants in it. And zone three, you can get into those willows, those you know, sh other larger shrubs. Um, that's good to go. So zone two is what I really try to focus in with these crews on managing. Of course, you have these areas too, you know, the headlands. This is uh, the Willamette Grange just down the road from me where they were, um, they had the uh, donate, they applied for the pollinator kit from Xerces Society and they planted shrubs on the edge there. Uh, so this is a similar principle to, you know, um, zone two headlands, they're kind of synonymous. I've talked to a lot of restoration ecologists and they tell me this is probably the three ways to do this. The first one is if you have 
if you want to build on what you have, do not use broadcast herbicides in areas that you already know you've got good bee plants. Clearly, people need to get broom under control, scotch broom under control, blackberries, people use herbicides. But if you go in with a broadcast herbicide and try to clean everything up, you're going to lose a lot of the plants that are already there. So we tell them if you want, if you've got bee plants in an area and you're trying to preserve them and you've got a really big weed problem and you do need to rely on herbicides, make sure you use grass specific. There are herbicides that only target grasses that will take down some of that grass. We really encourage them when they've got a good population of these plants to spot spray. So really taking out the thistle and the other things with very targeted sprays to kind of get those plants out of control so that the bee plants can come out or use mowing, which I'm going to talk about in a second. And the last thing is, oftentimes there's some great plants that are underneath the thatch. And when the grass comes up as it is right now, those plants get choked out successively. So sometimes getting that thatch off, and here you can see something that you probably can't do any more uh, prescribed burning, but kind of like mowing off that thatch in the fall and creating some some sunlight to come down can release a lot of those plants. Let's talk about mowing for just a second and thatch. This was a really interesting experiment from Western Oregon. How are we doing on time here as well? This is this is great stuff. So it's, we, we, we keep rolling, Anthony. This is invaluable information for us. Okay. There's always this issue of mowing for weed management. So the idea is that if you've got grass that's growing, if you mow at the flowering stage, what you end up doing is you, um, you're you doing two things. Um, first thing, when a, a grass is flowering, most of its resources have been are starting to move into the flower to provision those seeds. So if you mow it and it's an annual, one thing's going to happen, you're going to cut the reproduction. But for perennial, when you cut it close to flowering, you'll drain its vegetative tissue, all of that stuff underneath the ground, that if you turn it up, it'll just fragment into a bunch of new little monsters. Uh, if, you, if you mow it, you can kind of drain that reproductive tissue, especially when it gets close to flowering because it's starting to deploy resources upwards. And if you mow it a second time, you can accelerate this kind of draining of its you know, all the you know, all its power underneath the soil. But mowing also sort of is predicated that you don't have really tall bee plants that you're hitting at the same time. So there's a kind of trade-off here. I was really interested in this. I couldn't find a lot of examples of people doing this kind of study, but one example is a grass-focused one, is here you have a field that's been infested with tall oak grass, and which is a weed it can take over. And you can see these poor oaks are trying to get a hole, but they're not going to make it because they're being smothered. In this trial, what they did is they mowed, had four different mowing, uh, they, um, sorry, they had a, a, a number of different mowing regimes. The first one is, and this is done here in Corvallis, so it's very similar to where you are. In April, they mowed at a height of four to six inches and they left all the plant residue to fall. Then late May, or they did it in June, or they did it in early fall, or they did it in June and they kind of collected up all the thatch or they cut at a higher height in June, or they cut twice in June and early fall, or they didn't do anything. And what's notable, what they were trying to do is protect these native grasses, the California oak grass and the Romer fescue. What they found was if they cut it once at four to six inches, just as it was kind of cut, starting to um, head out, in fact, the the California oak grass got hit back. You can see the percent cover in treatment number two is below 5%. But the species that they were trying to encourage were at their maximal cover. So just mowing repeatedly every year as the weeds are kind of starting to head out can really shift the, um, the plant community underneath. It's fascinating. Something similar I encountered, I have a podcast in episode 246, I talk with Iowa State Extension, they've got all this problem, they grow all this corn and soybean, and then the effluent comes off and gets into the waterways. So wherever they've got a little bit of a slope, like you can see here, they've been planting these 
pollinator, well, they're, they're filter strips is what they're called, perennial plants, all perennial, that are deep rooted, that will take that effluent and suck it up into that strip so that it doesn't go into the waterway. It all, you can see here, they've got some black eyed Susans in here. So it does offer an opportunity uh, for um, uh, flowering plants, which, you know, maybe it exposes the bees to pesticides. I'm not sure, but the, the principle I was really fascinated with was this. I often think when you create these meadows, you focus only on, um, you know, annuals, you have annuals and some perennials. Here it's all perennial. And what they did was, for the first three years as these perennials, they would mow it. Oh, thank you. Um, they would mow it every year when it got to uh, um, about uh, just above their knees. Um, every any time that it got above their knees, they would uh, give it a mow. And what that did, they they pointed out, was for all the annual weeds, it cut off the reproduction. And for these perennials, it drove their roots deeper and deeper and deeper. So they really didn't let anything go to seed, which is what you would want if you had an annual in there because they were perennial. What this ended up doing is after this third year, they had this really solid bed of perennial grasses and flowers that uh, were stable, had really covered the ground cover so other weeds couldn't get in. And so, it, you know, then they could just go along and do a little um, burning or spot treatment on if a you know a blackberry or something got in there and they could keep it stable, which I thought was really remarkable. So no annuals, but really having perennials and in the first few years being aggressive with the mowing. I will say I'm getting more interested if you are replanting, not replanting just with forbs. I've been doing some trials with just a little bit of grass just to fill the space in. If you've ever planted just a pure um, forb, you know, like flowering, uh, like lupins and poppies and uh, farewell to spring, you'll notice there's gaps between the plants. But if you go in with a light level of grass, it'll fill those gaps in and prevent weed infiltration. So, um, I, but if you go too high with the grass, the grass will choke out all your forbs and you'll just have grass. So I've been playing around with these ideas of having some level of grass and some level of flowering plant. Here's a trial um, that I've been involved with uh, in Corvallis where we have a slow growing grass. You can see creeping red fescue uh, and all these forbs in between. This is the first year. Our hope is that that grass will close all the ground underneath um, and allow these forbs, here you can see another video of it, allow these forbs to establish so that we have something stable that will uh, kind of close the ground in and prevent the weeds from coming in. So we've got some, there, there you can see the little slow growing creeping red fescue. I did want to uh, also talk about herbicides. Um, herbicides can have lingering effects on the germination of plants. We've done some trials at Oregon State University with my colleague, Marcel Moretti. Here you can see he's taken popular wildflower plants and he's planted them at the same time as he's used a pre-emergent herbicide, a uh, herbicide that sort of um, you apply to prevent weed germination and looking for compatibility. He goes in and replants every year, and he's noticed with some of these plants, there is um, compatibility. And some of these, you just can't replant into that soil because they just won't germinate. So there, um, there are clearly some problems for growers that are using herbicides in being able to establish some of these plants. Um, I want to point out that herbicides, uh, like any pesticide, have a label, as you all know. You cannot judge the label and know if it's safe to bees by just looking at the front. These two hypothetical pesticides have the exact same active ingredient. They've just been marketed differently. Just to remind you what you're going to do when you look at a pesticide and think about whether you can use it is you're gonna um, open up that label on the front panel. You'll know it's a pesticide because it has an EPA registration number, which you'll see right in the front. You're going to read the entire label and it's gonna have um, directions for use, restrictions for using this product. But I, I wanted to, you to note, and it's also gonna have some very specific, if you're gonna be using it for this purpose, here are your restrictions. 
I want to point out that in the environmental hazard section of the label, you will have, if it is toxic to bees, you're going to have some language here talking about bee toxicity. You can see it here in the last uh, paragraph of environmental hazards. This product is highly toxic to bees exposed to direct treatment on blooming crops or weeds. Do not apply this product or allow it to drift to blooming crops or weeds while bees are actively visiting. I will tell you that none of the herbicides have such a warning. So herbicides typically um, are not acutely toxic to bees. The only one that I know of is Paraquat. And so um, the real issue with using herbicides in bees is, kill it, is, is creating the ground where you can't get plants to germinate or you kind of wipe out bee habitat. So using indiscriminate broadcast herbicides can really reduce the number of flowering plants in the landscape. We do have these cards. I give them up. Uh, they're, they're available to you as well, just to uh, direct people on how to read these labels. But I do want to just conclude now by talking about, I think if land manage, if our rights of way crews have some of these skills and know how to work around what they're doing, they'll come up with some great solutions. I always end my talks to them by telling them to be creative. Those people have a lot of tools, a lot of knowledge, and if they apply it, they'll do some great things. And I give them two examples. The one is George Kaufman. He uh, manages a lot of blueberry acres, and you can see this long, this very long hedgerow of pollinator plants. It's not in bloom at the time I interviewed him. In the podcast, you can see how innovative he is. He prunes the pollinator hedgerows in sections. It doesn't only manage the shrub size. Some of those roses can get out of hand but it extends the bloom. The prune section, the section that he prunes will bloom two weeks later than the unpruned section. This ensures that um, they have plenty of pollen and nectar across the season for bees and other beneficial insects. That kind of innovation, I think, you know, being able to roll out miles and miles of pollinator hedgerow, uh, you know, takes a lot of tool, a lot of know-how, and I know these people have that capacity and I kind of want to inspire them to do this kind of thing. The last story I end with is this one, Hampton Lumber. Jed was uh, his boss at Hampton Lumber saw a TED talk on pollinators and asked Jed to develop um, some way of increasing pollinator habitat in the cut blocks. Here you can see Jed with a very expensive bag of native seeds. He went, to, his boss told him to broadcast that into the cut block and you can imagine what happened. It disappeared. The cut block ate seeds. It was just nothing. It was then Jed used his smarts and didn't listen to his boss. He saw the slash piles that were cooling. He said that's where the invasive weeds always get a foothold. So as soon as the slash piles cooled in February, he went in and seeded. And lo and behold, he created some of the best bee habitat I've ever seen. And this has become standard practice uh, in Hampton, Hampton Lubbers. Uh, uh, cut blocks up in the Astoria area. So I always think these folks have a lot of skills, a lot of knowledge. And if we just give them a little bit of information, you know, they'll be able to pull stuff like this off. And that's all I got for you folks. Thank you so much. <laughs> Holy cow. Questions or comments here for Anthony. What a, what a volume of information here. Uh, I have a question. Um, regarding the last slide, why? Yeah. What was the difference between waiting and not waiting uh, that allowed the uh, plants to germinate? You, oh, you said, in, the, in the cut block. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. I think there's. I think anytime you seed into an area that isn't, you don't have an ex exposed soil. There's all sorts of competition and all sorts of other things. The nice thing with those slash piles is you kind of have the the heat has killed off all the weed seed and so you have this bed that is just completely com it's completely free of any other plant and th then you just input the seeds and then and also i think those those burn scars are dark and so they they germinate quickly and they come up real quick so i think the combination of those two things uh allowed it to in the in the seeds that just fell you know willy-nilly in the cut block they were covered by this and that and there's already weeds in there and it just it, it was just too much to get some of those very precious native seeds to germinate thank you so your point yeah. was it was he was doing the seeding right around the slash pile burn site 
into it. Into really directly into it. He, wait, he waited till it cooled. He'd, he'd have to go out with thermometers because those things like are hot for a long time. As soon as it was cool enough, then he would go in. Wow. Well, a story is just across the river from us, so we'll have to check it out. <laughs> Other questions, comments here for Anthony. So the Washington... oh, Karen, Karen's got a question, it looks like. Yes, I, it's a comment. This has been so helpful, so wonderful. It was just perfect. I wanted to thank you so much for coming to us and giving us this information. It was just great. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So the Washington Bee Atlas then is is up and running, right? And uh, Rhonda, you said you ran into the folks at the state conference. And you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so excited about all this stuff. I, I'm actually right now emailing Anthony. <laughs> get a hold of some of the stuff. So hopefully I've got your email address right. Yeah, I... It has been life changing for me as a master gardener the last two years, all that I've been exposed to in bees and pollinating. I don't think I've ever felt such a passion for something. I've spent a lot of time buying books, reading. I'm going to start my journal. I'm going to start recording what plants as I'm trying to redevelop my property. But um, yeah, fabulous presentation. Love to have you come speak at our home and garden show. Um, would love to have some of your information to give to some of our members to put articles in the Senior Sunset Times and the Daily World and some of the places where people really need to hear this message over and over. I'm really excited by it. Thank you for sharing today. And you wouldn't have to get up at one o'clock in the morning, Anthony. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, thanks. I really appreciate it. And I also, you know, I'm, I'm a I also have my own garden problem. So I, I, I really do in reciprocation uh, depend on our master gardeners to give me advice. I think, you know, the, my front area was like entire, I, I actually submitted a question to ask an expert and then had it fielded by <laughs> master gardeners. <laughs> I got this area. This is my soil. What do I do? <laughs> But, you know, that's that is indeed my inspiration, my takeaway from today, Anthony, is I'm thinking about all my edge areas. Right. You know, I mean, yes, you're thinking about roads and right of ways. Well, we have driveways. Right. And edges. Right. You know, and yeah. and similar concerns about zone one, zone two and zone three. Right. And so it's interesting to think about, OK, well, maybe if I think about it in terms of zones, you know, that could help me uh, hold a whole different practice of just managing the vegetation and managing it uh, successfully. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You guys are pros at zones already. <laughs> Other final comments, questions for Anthony here. Again, his, uh, you can see his email address is up there. Uh, um, uh, uh, be patient. Um, he and I had a, quite a bit of my email ended up in his spam folder. So, it, uh, so, so be persistent. Yeah. <laughs> if it, Thank you. Yes, sorry about that. Yeah. Good one, Mike. I like the, the pun there. Not joke. I had a comment for you. Up at Lake Sylvia, we've been revegetating, and we've been using a lot of Oregon grapes. So I'm really feeling proud of ourselves. We did something right. Excellent. That's so great to hear. And for those of you who are in Mason Bee culture, you'll you'll know that Oregon grape is a real you know a, a real key plant to get high uh, high returns, along with maple. Good job. And of course, we have a lot of maple up here and it, um, you know, and a lot of Mahonia too. And so, you know, and but it's just, it was, it, um, uh, again, the, the, the variety of species that we can service by having a variety of plants here it was as a significant takeaway. So thank you very much for that. I would say as well, I think uh, there, we have some active research on native Rs and native plants, and there is some evidence that, you know, in some cases, the native Rs and quite as good but like when you do get to Oregon grape it does look you know you may not if you had it kind of hidden away it'd be one thing but there are and I'm not thinking of like the you know the Asian um Berberus but like the Mahonias I think there are some varieties that look a little bit better that uh, that you know and I also think with Mahonia having it in the right spot like in full sun it starts to go red and 
you know, it's not so pretty, but in the right spot, it can do it look good and it's a great plant to have. But again, it goes back to different climates because here there's only one space and 10 acres that I have here in which I can grow Mahonia, right? And it isn't <laughs> <laughs> because, because I'm right on the coast, right? You know, I need is it's it's it, it has to be exactly that where I can get it gets the, the entire the, the best sun it possibly can because it's just it ain't it ain't growing anywhere else. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Yep. Other comments, questions for Anthony. I guess the the one final one. Could you? Is there a, is there comments about the heritage of your name, Anthony? Because this is it is it is quite the mouthful. When they came up with the master melatologist, I wanted to call it the bee enthusiast or something. They were insistent. They felt that they were doing. They were actual scientists in their own right. They wanted to be melatologists. It is funny that it is almost exactly like my name. It seems like I cooked it up, but that apparently my last name does mean honey pot, like a, you know, like a honey jar or something. And I, I, I don't, I, my, yeah, I don't, I don't know how I got into this occupation, but it certainly suits my name. <laughs> you were destined. It was fate. <laughs> it was fate. Other questions, comments for Anthony. If not, we'll move on and we'll close out today's at, uh, presentation here, you know, with a, a huge thank you for Anthony and it uh, and for the time and spent. And again, at, uh, and it, uh, for everyone here is that uh, this will be recorded and posted onto our YouTube channel. A reminder to everyone is that our board meets tonight at 530 p.m. 530 p.m. The link is here on the slide. It's also in the e-news. Uh, we have a full agenda, lots to talk about, including budget details and other other news and follow up from our strategic planning meeting last month. So, it, um, you know, so don't hesitate to, uh, to, to don't hesitate to join. It's welcome to all. And again, in chat, Anthony has posted his uh, his website and his cell phone number. So don't uh, you know, it's what a great resource, right, you know, to have available to us. So, again, thank you, um, Anthony, and thank you all for attending here today. With that, let's get off and it, uh, have a dry day today. And it, uh, you know, and it, uh, from my perspective, the chainsaw has stopped in the background. So I'll, I'll have to go out and see what uh, what sort of debris is left in my neighbor's yard. <laughs>